Hello and a warm welcome to the Move Live 52 podcast from your hosts Roland and Galena. I'm Roland and I am a skill-based weight loss coach who lost 110 pounds myself 17 years ago, kept it off ever since, and now I help my clients and readers to do the same. And I'm Galena, I'm a movement specialist and a trauma therapist, supporting people with chronic and persistent pain and recovering from emotional eating. This is your first time with us. Head on over to eatmovelive52.com slash podcast guest. Get your free download and uh, see how you can work with us. And now on to the show. Hi, and welcome to the Eat, Move, Live 52 podcast. We have a very special guest with us today. But she'll be a surprise for another two seconds. Um, Susan McLaughlin is a physical therapist specializing in men's and women's public health. Her private practice is in Salt Lake City, Utah, but she also has a wealth of information online where some of you might have already met her. Here's what I took from her website. I've been practicing physical therapy since 2001. In 2012, I transitioned away from major medical healthcare system to holistic and eclectic collection of skills all of which fit under the title of my business name, Align Integration Movement. I love her business name so much. As a practitioner, I meet each client with the empathy and compassion that I too have sat deeply embedded in the suffering of pain, and I've been able to transform my body, mind, and spirit to get out of it. On a personal note, Susan is somebody that I met in my restorative exercise specialist training, and... um, I have to say that in the whole res community, there is no one that I have more love and respect for. And it just Mm -hmm. gives me chills that you can be here and talk about movement this episode. And thank you so much for coming on and welcome. (laughs) Thank you. Wow. That, um, it's always a nice to sit back and receive. So I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. We've known each other for many years now and it's so interesting because i see you a lot more than you see me because you have such a wealth of wonderful videos online so there's so many Mm -hmm. videos that i send my clients oh great so so your voice and your body are uh, in my office a lot more than probably i am in yours so i always (laughs) like hi susan Mm. you know yeah that's great and i have to say that your way of delivering information online is so accessible and clear and it's just so easy to learn from somebody who's that well educated but who also embodies it so well so it's an honor that you said Mm. yes to come on the podcast oh thank you i was really pretty giddy when you asked and i'm always wanting to be able to have a chat with friends and since you know listeners unless they're podcast hosts themselves rarely know how all these come about but this happened naturally on facebook a couple of months ago i wrote an article that was called something like should i hold my abs tight while dancing and i posted it and you shared it and you said like yeah it's time that you know we start addressing these myths more and more and i said oh who better to invite to talk about movement myths than you. You've been in this work Mm. for a long time and you have stepped out of the mythical lands into the more holistic lands. And I feel like you're you're such a great person to answer some of these questions. Uh, But before that, can you tell us a little bit about your inspiration to practice physical therapy the way? Mm. You know, before I even got into doing the the track to study physical therapy, I'd always had a fascination with the human body on many different levels. And so my my interest to to move into the physical therapy realm was to be able to have access to having a deep understanding of allopathic medicine. Um, And then also realize that, you know, I could be a part of this medical model and I can also bring in some of my other interests that I have 
holistically, you know, body, mind, spirit, I knew that I would be eventually able to bring these in because um, as a physical therapist, I could be pretty independent in my care, you know, as long as I, you know, keep up with my licensing and my continuing education. And so I, for me, I felt like this was a path with, that I could make more, more, more impact. And that's why I went the, the route of physical therapy. One of the things that since I have started my own practices, I purposefully named my business align with the tags integration and movement without having a name of physical therapy because I didn't want to be placed in a box because I feel like there's so many different ways that we can um, heal many different modalities and I feel like in people's mind they have an idea of what physical therapy is it might be you know working with bands, <laughs> you know, those their bands, or, you know, just getting in and like trying to really bend a stiff knee or right, something, right. you know, and I'm, and I'm really not any of, of that. And um, so I don't know if there was an inspiration, maybe the inspiration was, uh, we are more than physical. Right. I love that. And and you understand that firsthand that we're more than physical because without that understanding, you can't really embody the kind of practice that you have. And so it's beautiful um, what you can offer to your clients and patients that other other people probably don't even know exists. I remember when mm -hmm. I, I referred Roland to physical therapy about maybe like a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And... Um, maybe you want to share how it wasn't bands and towels rolled up under the, the elbow. Well, I've been to physical therapy before because I had a shoulder injury, right? And Bill Hartman helped yeah. me with my, I don't know if it was technically carpal tunnel syndrome, but that was what I told him when I, when I complained about it. And so I had like, both of those were a little bit more traditional, right? Yeah dig in here, move this here, here's a band, here's a weight laying, laying, off your, laying off the table. But when I worked with Alice, it was more, I don't know, it's like a very, like I barely moved at all. And it was, but I went there for super stiff neck. Like my neck was so stiff, I couldn't turn my head to look behind me when I was backing the car out of the driveway that kind of stuff. And so, but no injury. Yeah. That we know. of. And so she's able to help me just by like putting her hands on me and then like, you know, pressing sort of deeply into the, the nerves. And I don't know. I mean, I don't know enough about this stuff to know how to accurately describe it. But when I would leave, I would be like, Oh my gosh, my neck is like, I feel like I'm one of those owls that can swivel it off the way, <laughs> the way around and it just felt amazing. Yeah. And I felt just like, like I was like floating on air for like the, for like, for like a whole day afterward. Yeah. And yeah, it was, uh, do you I mind just never would have expected that. Do you mind sharing what you found out about your nervous system with Alice? Well, she told me I had a, had a sensitive nervous system, which I was very offended by <laughs> originally because I I don't feel like I'm overly I mean but I know it's not the same thing but still I'm like <laughs> she was really offended yeah I always wanted to, I always picture myself as oh well, I'm like one of the normal ones like everyone else has a leaf I'm one of the normal ones and then you find out you have some and she was able to demonstrate it <laughs> um it was a mind it was a, a game changer mind change it changed my mind and my game yeah and and Roland's mm. body changed with just visceral manipulation and just very gentle work in less than six months. And uh, I have an yeah. owly kind of husband now. And uh, he just has such deep respect for how little they did and how much changed. And I feel like mm. people need to hear that from people like Roland because when they hear it from me, they're like, well, yeah, of course you had change. But Roland's a skeptic um, and uh, a PT skeptic. Yeah. And I feel like it's important to have healthy skepticism mm -hmm. and, to ha and to be around people who have healthy skepticism. <laughs> <laughs>
you know, better than being gullible because you're, you're, um, you're really inquiring and diving a little yeah. deeper for mm -hmm. taking things for granted. For sure. yeah. I'm putting those therapists on notice. They're going to have to show me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Susan, what have you, um, in your practice over the years, what have you added that's a little more eclectic that you never would have thought you would have used as a therapist? You know, what I've, I, I feel like the the work that I've done is is really has been I don't know I guess I would call it unraveling a bit and so as I've unraveled those aspects of me just to see what is here what I've found and I have deep respect for is the nervous system the autonomic nervous system and I never I never uh, thought that I would bring in that aspect so deeply into my practices. I remember being in, in PT school and having a person come speak to us and he specialized in chronic pain. And I was like, oh, those people are going to be the hardest people <laughs> to work with, you know? And, and honestly, what I find is there, that, that area of chronic pain does not scare me. And I feel like that is because I am um, tending more to the nervous system. And in fact, last year, I was drawn to the work of Kathy Kane. And Galena, I know you've studied mm -hmm. with Kathy Kane. And her practice is called somatic practice. And I don't have a background or certification in somatic experiencing. So I wasn't able to take some of the courses that she offered, but she did offer kind of a one-off uh, single training, she called them. And it was in relation to um, touch skills and working with the organs of stress. So using touch skills to work with the organs of stress to to allow for change in the nervous system. And I took that weekend training and my, 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 my system was blown in a very good way. And I brought it back to my clinic and I've been using it all year and I've seen big, big mm -hmm. changes. So I never thought that that would be, be even a, a niche really. And, um, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the nuance uh, of, of our nervous system. And, and, and like you were saying, Roland, you know, just that little bit of motion, maybe even a little bit of touch really shifted your system. And so it's, it's um, the subtle work is very expansive. Yeah. It, it, it really has done so much for me. Um, Touch skills has been just monumental in my journey As a, on the receiving mm -hmm. end and on the giving end. I feel like it puts the practitioner in this space where you really learn to trust the unfolding mm -hmm. of health um, in a way that's non manipulative, but it's just very right. intelligent and um, you can really accompany somebody on the journey. And it sounds very esoteric when you haven't received it. And people feel like, oh, you have to be, you know, um, you have to have practiced this forever. But in our classes, I spent two years with Kathy and Steve, and 95% of the people taking those classes are psychotherapists. They have no clue how to touch a person. You know, maybe like exactly. they have kids. That's helpful. But, mm -hmm. you know, outside of that, they sit like five feet from their patients because, you know, psychotherapy is a very interesting field as far as touch is concerned. And so they just rocked it just because they could be with people yeah. and i've taught roland how to do brainstem holds and adrenal holds and and he does an incredible job and he's like oh, what I'm doing. Yeah. And you just sit here and don't worry about me and my body exactly going to figure it out and he's done like hour and a half long brainstem holds for me you know mm -hmm. and uh, my touch therapist says roland's a saint but i can't believe we have that on recording <laughs> now <laughs> He's sensitive and a yeah. saint. There you go. A I'm sensitive saint. Down. 
14 minutes into the podcast. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm very curious, Susan. I, I came from Eastern Europe and I had a very different client population there. I also had different skills, so I might not be have seen what I have the skills to see now. But I'm wondering, mm. like even in the eight years that I've been in the United States, I've seen a, a change in the kind of complaints that people have. Um, I'm wondering in all the time that you've practiced, have you seen a change in the kinds of complaints and conditions people come to you with like more autoimmunity or more chronic pain or more, more pelvic floor disorder, more pelvic pain. Uh, and I understand that's very mm -hmm. different from a therapist to therapist based on the kind of clinic, but in your population, have you seen a change? I definitely see themes mm -hmm. in, in the, in this um, time span. A big theme is adrenal fatigue and thyroid mm -hmm. issues, as well as gut disturbances mm -hmm. um, that people are negotiating along with a pain mm -hmm. syndrome. And um, I know this is your your line of work too, and I've I've also seen you know in the history. Uh, quite a few eating disorder, history of eating disorder. And so now, now that I know more about our nervous system regulation, I do have more of an understanding that there may be in different parts of the body, um, but we're really looking at this this regulated nervous system is going to have good metabolism it's going to have a healthy mm -hmm. gut and it's going to have healthy hormones mm -hmm. and so i i do feel that that those those distresses in the system of people who are coming in um definitely need some tending so there's that route. And another thing, and I'm see I'm sure you see this a lot too, Galena, is uh hip impingement. <laughs> it's so huge, huge right now. Hip, mm -hmm. hip, hip. Whether it's like, you know, bona fide like labral tear mm -hmm. or just like a sticky mm -hmm. joint, it's just a really big Hey, big that's that's so thing. ass attached to me. And now mm -hmm. I find with technology. I never used to have clients that had thumping. Like I had not worked on a single thumb. Like I've been in this work for 17 years. And like since the iPhone 6 came out, mm, like it was literally mm -hmm. like the 6 came out and the thumbs started coming in. Like I've had clients mm. that have had thumb surgeries and middle finger surgeries, which are always funny to recover from because you have that funny bandage in the middle and you get to laugh about it. Um, <laughs> and and a lot of um, lower arm elbowy kind of stuff, and mm. it's like, well, like you're attached to this device that you have to hold in your hand in this really awkward way, and it's heavy. It's got EMFs in it, like all these things that um, that mess can mess a hand up. But also these uh, Fitbits and smartwatches. Like I have clients that are super sensitive to the light that's on the bottom yeah. that lights on the skin mm -hmm. and uh that's where yeah. black rock tape comes in very handy and just like, tape it over mm. but i've had people with like tendonitis under it and so just thinking about all the disruptions and the emfs and the wi-fi and how all of that affects us and then the constant stay still and so our poor systems yeah. are either in fight or flight or in shutdown like there's no safe and social soft vagal place for people to restore and heal and then they just want to come to us to fix so that's what i've seen mm -hmm. the era of the thumb john Sar john Isn't sarno that? says in the divided mind that these conditions come in phases and they become like he calls yeah. them fashionable i think or like something like that like do you remember when everybody had carpal tunnel <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i remember um him saying you know uh not a lot of people will talk about reflux or they'll um now it's what more well known that reflux is associated with stress and so it's not as as fashionable mm. anymore 
you know, to, to have when you that. Were just overeating and eating the wrong stuff. It was easy to just take a <laughs> pop a pill. It, it was <laughs> right. Right. And nothing pisses yeah. my clients off more than their doctors telling them to reduce their stress. Like if you really yeah. want to piss off somebody, that's, that's advice that you can use because people mm. don't know how, or like, or like I'll post no. a lecture somewhere in one of my groups with Gabor Mate or any of those people. And I'll have people like, I hate Gabor because he tells all the right stuff, but because he doesn't tell you what to do. And it's like, it's not, yeah. there's nothing to do. There's nothing. You just have to mm-hmm. learn how to be. And when people mm-hmm. want to do stuff, there's nothing to do. You actually have to stop doing and start taking some stuff away. Nobody likes to hear that. No, it's definitely more comfortable. Yeah, we'll get some unsubscribers from this episode, I'm sure. We always get mm-hmm. unsubscribers when we send a newsletter for people to reduce their stress or start sleeping. Mm-hmm. That is challenging. Yeah. So what do you do? How do you educate your parent, a patient about <laughs> parents? Don't educate your parents. This is dead end. How do you educate your patients and what resources do you give them when they are in chronic pain? Mm. Um, Well, you mentioned that I have uh, a lot of YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I, I really am big on self-care and, and education. So I put a lot of, material in my blogs and I put a lot of material on YouTube because when I finish a session this is where the integration comes in is what can someone do for home to integrate what we just did in the clinic today and so I use I use the information in my 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 YouTube videos and then also you know I'm I'm a uh, information, I like information and information junkie. And so, you know, my part of my practice is I like to scan and read and see what's out there. So if I find something that has a theme of say, um, chronic pain or pain, or what can I do with anxiety, I feel, then, you know, I kind of put that in my favorites and then that's that's the go-to for people because I feel like I have a way of saying things and people may or may not um, be able to distill how I'm saying it if they hear it again in another way they might be in and maybe they've had a chance to integrate and maybe practice what they've been working on so when they hear it at a different time from someone else, something else might mm-hmm. sink in. So they have they have more of that that learning or the education integration moving through their body. So I really love um, trying to get other people besides me yeah. uh, delivering the information. Sure. Honestly, sure. yeah, because I think that's that's. Um, really important. I, I, I still feel like I don't have a, a deepening in the language mm. um, to be able to put meaning to it sometimes for others. Sometimes I do. And other times I'm just like, wow, how am I going to say this yeah. to someone? And that's, that's one of my challenges, I find, because it is kind of, it can be kind of esoteric, but at the same time, it could be pretty physiological and anatomical and it's meeting someone in the yeah, middle and, and also finding like the state they're in and what they can hear yep like it, that's right? exactly like right this, yeah some states you just sound like wah, 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 and it, mm-hmm. people can't discern what you're saying and that's where when they're mm-hmm. at home and they don't feel as you know um kind of raw in the therapeutic environment because for some people it's a it's a triggering environment they can be home and they can watch a video and they hear somebody in an Australian accent saying something they're like oh that's a cute accent so now they're all of a sudden they're paying attention because it's like all of a sudden you you know Lorimer Mosley sounds funny and his accent is funny so now they're paying attention he has different prosody than you do so their nervous system is in a different space um, yeah, I'm really very curious about how you use sound in your practice and sound healing. Oh, 
Yeah, so yes. So Roland, one of the things I never thought I would bring into my physical therapy practice is using sound. So I uh, have been certified in a technique called biofield tuning. And what I've discovered in my own just overall healing process is my system resonates to sound it just opens me up and shifts things just incredibly i and and whether that sound be you know just um you know those the the crystal bowls or whether it's the tibetan bowls or a drum or a gong or even you know search in youtube for um de-stress music mm -hmm. or or expansion you know it all has kind of those biurnal mm -hmm. beats i really resonated with that and so when i went to when we went to ireland last year part of our trip we had a guide um take us to some really just magical places and when i was looking at what she offered she offered a sound healing it was using these tuning forks and so that was my first introduction into the sound therapy and um before i even i think before we were, we even went to ireland i had already purchased all of my tuning forks and, and equipment because I was like, yes, I, I love this stuff. And when I started taking the training, it's just this, this coherent frequency, whatever our stresses that are in our energetic field, they can be entrained to this coherent frequency of the tuning mm -hmm. fork. And it can really, really shift the system. I mean, I actually had one woman I was working with. We did a um, a tuning field uh, bio tuning field session, and when she came back to see me, she said I wasn't leaking urine for like days wow. after, and that was not the intention. Right. That was not right. the intention, but it just kind of settled her system, where things shifted Amazing. for her. Hmm. Yeah, that is so neat. And we yeah. know so little about, you know, sound. Well, I, I guess there's a lot of ancient wisdom around sound. And there's so little use of it in, in allopathic settings. None, I guess. Um, yeah, like my yeah. I, I had a minor surgery last September. And the first thing the nurse asked me was what kind of music would you like to listen to during your surgery? And, you know, I come mm. from a part of the world where it's like, if you don't die, you're good. <laughs> so I was yeah. like, what? Like, it took me like a few minutes to process. And she was like, and what would you like to look at on the screen? And wow. um, my my surgeon and I are trained by, you know, you know, Lois. We're both trained mm -hmm. by Lois. Yeah. And so we have some common language around nervous system safety. And he was like, where would you like your heavy bag on your belly or on your chest? And it was a great experience, even though it was a very stressful mm. surgery and my body was very stressed out, but I had this containment around me that I could have something safe to return to. You know, it wasn't like I'm going to go yeah. down the spiral and not come back out. And even though yeah. my heart rate dropped down to 30, I was able to get myself mm. out of it because I had enough safety around to come back to. It was very cool. That. Hey, if you enjoyed this episode with our friend, physical therapist Susan McLaughlin, be sure to stop by the show notes at eatlive52.com slash Susan and grab your free download, Gentle Regulation Exercises for Times of Tension and Discomfort. We put it together just for you. We know you're going to love it. And uh, be sure to stop by and let us know what you think. eatlive52.com slash Susan. So in your own journey, you you, you yeah. kind of got into this a little bit and were influenced by your own pain, right? Yeah. Definitely. So how has uh, that been a key and how have you like learned from your own experiences and uh, brought that into your practice? Mm -hmm. For me, I, I was in chronic pain for 10 years, low back pain and hip, hip pain. And that hip pain was what I would say is like kind of that classic SI joint, mm -hmm 
instability, you know, that feeling where like everything is just seizing up and you just can't take a step. Very similar to what a lot of pregnant women will experience with the pubic symphysis issues um, in, you know, the third trimester. And I feel like when I, um, I want to say take, take my healing into my own hands, you know, because I always look, I think I was, I was so much in my suffering. I was looking for that magic bullet, you know, that one, one stop shop. It's that one session that's magically going to, you know, take, take everything away. So that's kind of that zone of searching. And actually what ended up happening is when I, uh, dove into the pelvic health specialization and I was doing the training for that, I was really kind of in overwhelm because I'm like, oh, wow. It's like, not only am I working with the musculoskeletal system, I really need to know the urinary system, the bowel system, the digestive system, the reproductive system, hormones. Like I was like, whoa. So I was just like reading, 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 reading. And that's when um, I had fallen into the, um, the Katie Bowman information mm -hmm. about um, the no more cable stuff. Because I had at the time clients who did really well with some of the traditional pelvic health, you're doing 100 kegels a day. And there were, you know, half of them weren't getting any butter. I was like, what's going on here? So I wanted to figure that out. And so when I saw her material, and I literally, I read every one of her blogs, and I gathered as much information as I could online. And then when I saw that she was teaching her program and in Ventura for the last time, and this was before it launched fully online, I was like, I'm going to go study. So I was learning all this new stuff about alignment and um, objective markers. And in the process of doing just the stuff at home on myself, Roland, that's when I got out of pain. I was not intent in the suffering of pain. I was in the spaces in between. I was in the process of just discovery and I got out of pain. So for me, I was like, yeah, I'm a cheerleader. I'm a cheerleader for this process. I loved being a teaching assistant and Katie's amazing. I mean, her whole program is amazing and I learned so, so much from her. Um, and I, you know, looking back, I realize it could have been something else. Mm -hmm. What, what was beautiful about me getting out of pain in that experience was that it wasn't, her, it wasn't necessarily her exercises, it was what, that, that space. I was, I was out of the pain space, I was out of the suffering space, and I was just learning. I was curious, I was having fun with this work, and I was applying it to my body, and then I got out of pain. So I realized that, you know, well, just from doing a lot of the work, I was carrying a lot of tension. Mm -hmm. So there's undoing, like you were saying earlier, Galena, some of this undoing and the, the, you know, taking things off layer by layer by layer to really get to what is here in the baseline. Yeah. Then you can really get a sense of what is that movement like? There's the strength mm -hmm. now, you know, there's a strength because you're actually getting movement in the system. So that was kind of the first step and realizing that a lot of that, that pain was driven by so much energy in my nervous mm -hmm. system, you know, so much um, fear energy and tension energy. It's just that gripping, gripping, yeah. gripping. And so as I've been able to, um, you know, kind of unravel some of those bits, um, it, it's given me a bigger perspective and some of the integration moves that I've, everything that I give to my clients, I've done for myself. So I can, I feel it in my body and everybody feels it in their body maybe differently, but I know what it feels like in my body. So I feel like that's really helped um, because I'm not just giving them, oh, you have 
something going on here. We're going to give you clamshells and bridges, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and usually what I'm offering has more of a neuro uh, re-education bent. Very, I would say, you know, um, Feldenkraisian based or, you know, kind of the Hannah somatics based. I really love the slow and the ease and the um, bringing in three planes mm -hmm. of motion. Um, so I, I kind of feel like my body is a little bit of a, a guinea pig. And what I realize now as I'm becoming more aware that a lot of my pain is not even physical bait. Like it's not, it isn't structural. It's, it's an organ related. Um, it's driven by an organ, but I feel it in what feels like the yeah. physical <laughs> or the muscle. Does yeah. that make sense? So it's like, oh, you know, I, I, like when someone describes what, what's going on in their body and, you know, bending over is just like super uncomfortable, you know, a lot of times it may, it, it might just be something going on where the kidney and the adrenal, yeah. they really just need to be yeah, supported. That is definitely the case with me. I, similarly to you, came to a kidney's program after almost 20 years of low back pain. And then mm -hmm. my pain resolved during my training, um, like yeah. during the year that I took to learn her program. Um, that's also the, the year that I, I stopped uh, owning my own practice and I just spent a year learning. I was just rolling, mm -hmm. uh, brought home the, the bacon and the eggs yeah. and the kale. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I got to just learn and adapt to life in America and kind of just like re let my body sleep and, uh, I remember during my uh, certification live week, for the first time, I felt what it's like to have a body with less tension. And I thought all the yeah. tension was gone. It wasn't until years later that I actually felt what that was like. So that first thing wasn't it. <laughs> but when I came yeah. to a second certification week, I came not to learn more, but to get that feeling again. I couldn't get mm. it because that layer of tension yeah. was already gone. And I was so mad. I was like, I want it gone yeah. again. Like I wanted to strip another layer, but to strip another layer, I had to go to my nervous system and to the way that I um, interacted with other bodies and other bodies yeah. were very scary to me. And that's not something that I found mm -hmm. out until much later that it was actually yeah. being with other humans that stressed me out, that my body didn't yeah. know how to be in this safe interbeing space. And uh, it's so interesting how tension and pain come back and they can come back. Like I was free from all this for eight years and it came back in January this year. So I've been navigating this yeah. pain journey again because of a completely different reason. So kidneys and mm -hmm. adrenals and all of that. So it's been very, very interesting to see how it's not like, okay, I'm done. It's like, it's like, no, exactly. you're in this river and you Coco can go in the same river twice and there's going to be some rough spots as long as you're alive and you can meet them with, with grace and openness and vulnerability. And so people like you and me, I feel like as our bodies are the canvas, we can become better teachers out of it. I think so. Yeah. I know so. So I want to pull out the big guns and get to, the, yeah. get to the common myths in PT. And I'm going to start with the one that pisses me off the most, which has yeah. a place, but it has been generalized. So I'll have people who come to me with low back pain and they cannot relax their belly. And they usually have low back pain and constipation and incontinence, and they cannot relax yeah. their belly. And so they say, well, I learned how to do this from my back 20 years ago. And I've been sucking in yeah. for 20 years. And there's some of them that will show me these fancy ways of sucking in and up. Like they'll actually engage their pecs to pull up oh, too. Wow, yeah. I'm like, nice pecs. <laughs> um, and it's just weird because it's not reflexive. Yeah. It's voluntary. It's like a made up movement pattern. It's like that stomach vacuum. Um, like the yeah. fitness people do, that the, the bodybuilders do. Kind of, yeah, but imagine with the pecs, like if you could just pull that up with your pecs, it's so fancy. So, so Susan, where does this come from? Where is their place for it? And where does it become potentially not? You know, I really, you know the story, The Emperor's New uh -huh, Clothes? Yeah. Where um, it, it takes someone to say, you're not wearing clothes? Uh-huh, uh-huh, right? uh-huh. 
And so <laughs> I think I think what's kind of happened is people don't want to do the wrong thing. And so, oh yeah, I need a, I need to make sure to tell people to brace before you move. I I honestly, I I honestly don't know. I think I think some of the studies that came out um, with Paul Hodges, and I don't know the um, what year that came mm -hmm. out. Um, that was where they were able to measure the pre-activation of the deep abdominal muscle and the the diaphragm to arm movement, mm -hmm. and so that that pre-activation, it's it's. Um, you know, I don't know if that's kind of where that that pre-activation come from. Where I can I can see that there is a place to to teach your system how to go active to tension to the task. But what happens is is people when they're going to prime their system to tension to the task, they've lost it because they did that big that big bracing. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one piece where, you know, I can see where it it could be a good thing to establish maybe uh, that pre-activation pattern where it's just not happening. So you want to work on maybe that timing and the coordination. And so in that in that piece where, say, for instance, I'm going to you know lift, um, I don't know, let's say like like a deadlift mm -hmm. or something no let's not do it to a weight but um getting out of a chair so getting out of a chair like bending tasks typically do have you know higher higher pressures down down into the the pelvic organs and out into the abdominal wall so maybe priming the task where rather than just bracing and holding or tightening up and then going to move, maybe a person can make a sound like a mm -hmm. shh, you know, where, where there's some tensing happening, but it's not the over tensing. So the muscles are maybe going in an appropriate direction for the task and they're guiding in a little bit. Yeah. But honestly, I think what, what, what's happening is someone or some body of knowledge started this whole thing of you just need to tighten up and hold it on because i think sometimes when someone's in discomfort people will say oh it just feels best when i'm holding tight mm -hmm. and i'm protecting mm -hmm. and then that stays the pattern right like if somebody with um you know some hypermobility in my lower back and some si instability and a a lifetime of low back pain for me what was really helpful was to go in a posterior tilt and like really flatten mm -hmm. my low back before I load mm -hmm. but that was mm -hmm. the only way I could do load so I hurt in every other situation Roland and I just went to boot camp uh, and the teacher had us do like um, dying bugs and some stuff on our backs. And she was like, make sure yeah. that you're really pressing and pushing your low back into the ground. And yeah. I look around, there's like 40 people. They're like digging holes into the grass, you know, with their lumbar yeah. spine. And that's not appropriate pressure, especially no. for a dying bug, which has therapeutically this completely other set of circumstances that, you know, you need to have certain structures aligned and certain structures holding and certain structures moving. And, a particular kind of breath so you've taken a dying bug out of context you've put it in a fitness program and completely butchered it um and yeah it's perpetuated mm -hmm. it's it's taught and perpetuated and and then it just continues until someone will say well that doesn't make yeah. sense and it's the same uh, i feel like some of the some of our uh, problems are this kind of taking the sedentary population and trying to load a sedentary population with loads and skills above their load and skill level. And so we're kind of like ban trying to band-aid. Um, right. Like this is what should be happening. So make it happen instead of how do we create the environment where this can naturally happen 
and maybe it's not even possible anymore since so many people develop without natural movement, right? So where, right. where is this ability? But it's the same, I think, if we can um, morph this into a Kegel discussion, it's the same with Kegels where people will ask me, should I do Kegels? And I'll say, well, let me refer you to a pelvic floor PT who will establish mm -hmm. what you need. And then if you do, if you do, do need them, <laughs> then, <Yeah. laughs> um, then there's different ways that they can monitor the ultrasound, what you're tensing, how you're doing it, how hard you should go, how long you should hold. You don't just like go and crank out a hundred in the bathroom right. or laying down or, or using to, right. to broader kegels. To broader kegels. Or people are like, should I get one of those eggs? I'm like, um, <laughs> not without going to a physical yeah. therapist first. This is why these right. people go to school and specialize and they have equipment. You can't just like wing it. Like with the body, people are like, I'm just going to run around. You can't just wing it. I mean, probably you could if you grew up on a farm or something, but I think most modern people can't just wing it. Right. And, you know, I really do feel like it is a lot easier to do something right? It, it's easier to say, well, I'm going to go get my biofeedback unit and use my probe to do my kegels so I know what I'm doing, or I get the, the yoni mm -hmm. eggs. It, it gives someone something to do rather than working with someone on how to be. And that's the challenge. And that's the scary part because to really dive into, as you were sharing earlier, being this is a whole uh, mental, emotional behavior change that, that is required in the entire system, in the organism. And that can be really scary. Oh, yeah, you're, you're gonna, we're gonna ask our, our clients slash patients to get rid of their operating system and get a new one, you know? Right. And it's like, we have to be very gentle with that and not making anyone mm -hmm. wrong for having a nervous system that helped them survive. Good job, you're here. Exactly. And then exactly. what do we do? What do we do later? Like for me, like I got incontinence when I was 16, you know, yep. and incontinence didn't go away until two years ago. And that's so many years of work and working with the nervous system and finally getting an oral device and, you know, all these things to work on the upstairs areas so that the downstairs areas could respond appropriately. But you know, most, most people aren't even aware that there's so much remodeling that needs. And so I'm just gonna do a bunch of Kegels. Never gonna work. Not like that, yeah. not for that kind of system. No. So let's go to another no. myth, uh, locking your knees. Now, mm. I'm one of those people I can't straighten my knees. So like, that's not a problem for me. <laughs> I'm always trying to straighten them. Um, but where did that come from? And why do people think it's bad to, to have straight legs? To be honest, I don't know where it came from. I thought it came from the military, yeah. where when people had to stand on guard and then people fainted because, um, I'm not sure, I, honestly, I don't know where it came yeah, from. I always thought it came from the military. Yeah. yeah. And, and the other one is um, uh, like, like martial arts, like Tai Chi and, um, yeah, there's soft, soft, knees. Knees, soft knees, but there's a very different reason for the soft knees. So, yeah. so is it bad and, to lock your knees? What's your verdict? Um, the hyperextended yeah. knee? Um, it's not good on the joints <laughs> for the long term. But see, that's the thing, Galena, is it's a strategy. Wait, it's a stabilizing strategy, yeah? It's a stabilizing strategy that someone has used and, and, and typically in a family system, you know, other people in the family have it too. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I feel like if, if I could be a fence setter, <laughs> it's like, we, we want to be in that in between. Yeah. And it's really about riding the wave as much as you can to find that balance. And you have to know your edges, know your edges so you know where center is, yeah. right? It's kind of that, um, what Gary Ward talks about in his AIM mm -hmm. course, you know, finding center, where are your edges? Let's go big, go big to find that yeah. middle. Yeah. 
And, and I, and I mm -hmm. like that. So don't hang out in those edges. Find that mm -hmm. in between. Yeah, so don't go to never lock your knees and uh, never bend mm -hmm. your knees, but find the middle and find where those bones can be stacked in a way, if they can be stacked, that is the most um, kind of like natural for you, right? Because we have right. such big differences from person to person, um, you know, and people come and be like, oh, in martial arts, I'm like, in martial arts, we're like people that are five feet tall, you're like seven feet tall, <laughs> you know, like there's such massive differences in how your body looks when you bend your knees like that. And who are you attacking? Right. <laughs> and, the, and the last <laughs> one is this kind of like, um, it's more in podiatry. Uh, I have clients that had like plantar fasciitis 20 years ago, and they're still wearing either an insert in their mm. shoe or they're always buying a tennis shoe that has a positive heel right. because their podiatrist told them it's bad for them. And apparently yeah. Dr. Ray um, from Portland is not their podiatrist because he wouldn't say that. But uh, whoever got them better from their uh, plantar fasciitis is still like a voice in their head that says right. never, never go barefoot. So like they're wearing shoes in the house, like 20 years later. I'm like, how long ago was your, was your right. PF 20 years later? earlier right like, you're right still doing right. what the doctor said 20 years ago it's crazy you're still yeah. rolling your foot on yeah. a frozen water bottle too <laughs> <every night. laughs> so you know i think galena you're bringing up fear mm -hmm. you know uh we, with that we're just kind of locking everything in so you're we put it we put a little mini cast on with the heel left and that could get us out of a cyst a symptom great let's take it out but then we get fear of something coming back mm. and so we stay you know we stay in that pattern yeah. and the kind of and it's and like so, movement avoidance yeah exactly that fear avoidance exactly because yeah. it's like oh i don't i don't want that to come back yeah oh i have a client that's like i don't unload the dryer oh why not well because my, my doctor yeah. told me not to well how long ago 12 years ago it's like <laughs> <laughs> maybe you should start unloading yeah. your dryer like one piece of clothing maybe at a time so then I get like all these videos of like am I doing it right and it's like oh my god um it, and that's why play has such a good uh use like yeah. I play a lot with my clients we play with balloons and with like all sorts of uh, sticks and bouncy things and platforms and uh so that we can we can get their system to be paying attention outside there's so exactly. much attention inside it's like let's just play with a stick let's play with a let's play with spatulas and balloons and uh um let, let's just see what what silly thing we can do so that we can get you relaxed so we can get activation without fear you know mm -hmm. and, and fight or flight without fear is play right i love yeah. that so mr roland's gonna ask the next question yeah, so if, if you, with all this being all of this stuff here, if you could design an ideal movement therapy program for someone who's in pain, what would it include? You know, what's something you would never include? Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. I think what I would include is um, different modalities. Mm. Oh, I love that answer. So I love if, it. I love it. It's if if expense were not an issue, is that is that the yeah yeah yeah, yeah. expense no. were not an issue? Expense, all of a sudden, insurance um, covers me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be I you know have your pocket of five different modalities yeah. that that you can work with because because that way you can be coming at it in, from different systems. That would be lovely. And to be honest, I really don't know. Um, you know, I think we were just talking above about, you know, the bracing, the locking in and, and all of that, that would, that would never be in one of my programs. Well, um, going back to your multiple modalities, I feel like that's a good thing because a lot of people like me, if you go into something where you're a little bit skeptical, but you'll always have some sort of a tool that I'll, re I will respond to, right? And then as right. I start to see results, my my mind starts to open up and I start to allow different things to positively affect me. And uh, so having all those extra tools at your disposal, it's, it gives you sort of different paths and it increases the chances of long-term success. 
I agree. Well, and I also feel like we, we, healing is so relational as well. So like Mm -hmm. oftentimes, um, my private practice that I closed in spring was in a chiropractor's clinic and there was a male and a female doctor. And so often people would switch from one to the other and it wouldn't matter which one, what direction they would go. And they'd be like, I feel so much better. And it's like, perhaps like a six foot seven doctor who's male is what you needed. Or perhaps (laughs) a young, soft, motherly archetypal presence is what you needed. So Mm -hmm. um, it's just so important to, to know that, you know, healing happens in an environment and our gender, our size, our our voice, uh, whether we have kids or not, like all these things and, and even like unseen things like spiritual belonging and uh, what your office smells like, like all these things can influence healing. And so the more environment you can go in, the more opportunity for your system to respond. I agree. I, uh, I'm, I have a new physical therapist I'm going to see next week. And I've been oh. stalking her on Instagram for like three months. Nice. So Fun. I love her. So I already love her. Mm-hmm. So I know when I go yeah. there, it's somebody that I've already done stuff with. I've done her videos. I've right. listened to success stories. I've seen her testimonials. I've talked to her on the phone. It's like, I know yeah. I'm going to have a good experience. I'm primed for that. Yeah. Exactly. And that's kind of what I found now that I've been in my practice, my, my private practice since 2012. I have more um, SEO, you know, more optimization with certain, with certain mm-hmm. searches. And so when I inquire, how did you find out about me? more and more and more i am getting feedback that they found me online Mm. so in their search there was something about the languaging Mm. that drew them Mm. in or something about i'm not sure what it was that drew them in and and that to me is is really cool because i know when i'm looking for a provider i really like to look at you know what's what's there on the website and you know, what kind of social media presence is there. And for me, I haven't taken the leap into Instagram. I'm only on mm-hmm. Facebook. And that works for me as a mm-hmm. person because I'm not in the, I'm not in the big catchy, uh, you know, f- photograph. I, I'm not, I'm not a, my, my strength is not a show mm-hmm. person. My strength is probably just kind of being the steady mm-hmm. Eddie. And so because I am an information uh, junkie and I like, I like articles, I like reading, I like being inspired visually, but also through different sorts of media, Facebook mm-hmm. has worked for me. So, you know, for me, um, I don't know what's going on Instagram. <laughs> so I'm glad people still get on Facebook. Um, that would be fun sometime to just track to see, you know, are people really finding me in Facebook yeah. or is it just word well, of you mouth? have a delightful presence online. So if I found the outcome to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so you. How can people find out how to find you? And yeah. How to so, you? uh-huh. So my website is alignforhealth.com. And then on Facebook, um, I'm under Align Integration and Movement. Excellent. And we're going to put these in, uh, links in the show notes. This, is going to, this podcast is going to air somewhere in the first week of October and or second week yeah. of October. And you have something coming up in October in Salt Lake City that we're going to show on Facebook. Uh, can oh, okay. you say a couple of words about the workshop that you have? Yeah. So every quarter, I offer a prenatal and a postpartum workshop. And October 12th, I think it is, I have a postpartum workshop. And it's something steady that I use uh, to let people get Mm -hmm. to know me. And as well as, of course, share some really solid information to build a foundation for healing um, in the postpartum time period. But then also in the pregnancy or the prenatal workshop, it's priming the system to build capacity and space 
and to bring in more more motion into the pelvis and the sacrum to be able to have a, a better delivery. So they're they're kind of working on just more of the, the basics and the foundational pieces for people to tap in to their systems for healing. And I offer them every quarter. And I just so in my in on my website I have a workshop tab where where people can schedule cool. for so either workshops. somebody who's a super fan will hear this immediately as soon as we release on iTunes or they're gonna catch your next nice i love it thank you so much for being our guest it's been such a delight to have you on i feel more regulated after talking to you for an hour i don't know about roland but Wonderful. i think i'm gonna take a nap <laughs> nice thank you galena thank you, you roland welcome. thank you for joining us it was wonderful thank you bye have a great day bye bye, bye. Hey, before you go on to the next podcast, be sure to stop by eatmovelive52.com slash Susan and grab your free download, General Regulation Exercises for Times of Tension and Discomfort, eatmovelive52.com slash Susan.